terrific. Well, good morning. Great to uh, see many of you. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up, Dr. Doug. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, the music team. We appreciate your help this morning and for all who contributed in the first service. So great to be back uh, with you to start this new year uh, with you all at Roslyn Ridge. Um, Happy New Year to all of you. I know we are all anticipating and hoping for a, a wonderful 2021. I know 2020 has been a challenging year for uh, this world, for this nation, for this province, for our communities. And no doubt many in front of me this morning who I can't see or uh, don't know or maybe not be aware of specific circumstances. Many has been a really trying, difficult year of bereavement, employment issues, financial issues, health issues. So we, we just pray that uh, as we continue to worship the Lord, as we continue to serve him, as we continue to look into his word, that we will be really encouraged over the next five weeks uh, in the messages that the Lord has uh, shared with me and taught me through. And I hope that I'm able to communicate that to you in such a way that you'll be built up and encouraged in your faith and uh, we, we look forward to that. And I appreciate so much your prayers. And let me just say uh, thank you so much to Keith, uh, hearing the announcement earlier. Um, Keith has been a tremendous support to me as a visiting speaker over all these years with connecting with me, with praying for me and clarifying things for me and feedback with message ideas. So um, I really appreciate Keith so much and we'll continue to pray for him and for Dave. Uh, my prayers are with you, my friend. So great to... Um, see you step into that role. Uh, certainly the Dupre family have uh, been a part of my life for a very long time. And I've known Dave and Michelle since they were little kids. Um, not that I'm much older, um, but I am older. And uh, I just appreciate um, Kirk and Dorothy and the whole family and uh, appreciate Dave stepping his role and continue to pray for you. Uh, welcome to my home office. This is where I live. <laughs> um, this is where I'm gonna be teaching phys ed for the next month. Uh, believe it or not, in this 10 by 10 office. Uh, I apologize a bit for the boring background, but you see, uh, I've learned having been Zooming for many months before uh, the fall, um, that if I have too much behind me, people sort of start looking at the pictures and, hey, Dale, where's that? And who's that? And where were you? Because the rest of this office you can't see is full of pictures. And, uh, and so, in fact, one of these pictures, I just turned around and looked, and it was uh, my grandfather, Ross's dad, in a championship hockey team picture taken in 1926. Believe it or not, that's soon going to be Uncle Ross, a uh, 100-year-old picture, so something I treasure very much. And just to clarify, in week one, you all know my art skills. Uh, no, I did not paint that, all right? So just want to clarify that day one. And now we get into the message in the series that the Lord has uh, given to us. The title of the series, as has been advertised, is Add to Your Faith. And you'll see where that title comes from in just a moment. It's going to focus on the first 11 verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, now, you might say, Dale, that's 11 verses over five weeks. You're not covering a whole lot of ground here. Friends, you're going to see, as I've been learning and hope to share with you, we could spend 11 weeks easily on these 11 verses. This is, this is life-changing stuff. In fact, every time we open the Word of God, in one sense, it should be life-changing. And, and this has truly been that for me. And you'll see as we, as we begin to unpack the truth that is shared here with us, that, that there's so much here. And so we're going to limit it pretty much. We're going to certainly roll around the scriptures and references, but we're going to focus the first 11 verses of 2 Peter chapter 1 over the next five uh, weeks. Regarding the overall theme of this letter, the New King James Study Bible says this, with its emphasis on holy living and its efforts to refute false teachings, 2 Peter stresses sanctification. Ultimately, Peter traces the motivation for leading a holy life back to the imminent return of Jesus Christ. So with that having been said, let's open our Bibles to 2 Peter cha um, chapter 1. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Again, you'll see in a few moments why there's some repetitive language uh, that is used here that is really crucial, I think, to our understanding and connecting some wonderful thoughts that Peter expresses here as directed by the Holy Spirit. So 2 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 1. 
Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption as in the world through lust. But also this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith. So here is the title of the series taken right from scriptures, verse 5. Add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control to self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither uh, barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord bless to us the first of five readings over these five weeks of that amazing passage of Scripture. Let's pray. Father, we just turn to you now and ask for your, your help and your blessing. Father, we ask and invite the Holy Spirit to be very present with us now as we seek your direction um, in teaching us and giving us this day what we need. Uh, Father, just will we carefully give you all the praise and the glory and pray that our lives will be changed in some way as a result of opening the scriptures and considering this truth today. Thank you, and we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Our focus today is going to be on verses 1 to 4. Week 2, 3, and 4 will basically be verses 5, 6, and 7. We'll see that in, in a few moments, and then the last message will look at the last uh, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, basically, as we, again, begin to unpack some of the wonderful truth that is here. Returning to verse 1, I want you to, first of all, notice that the author of this letter is, in fact, Simon Peter, and notice how he introduces himself, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Right away, I was initially struck uh, with the humility of this introduction. Simon Peter, a bondservant, and an apostle. Peter identifies himself first as a servant that was bound by choice to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what makes this initial descriptor stand out is the fact that Peter was obviously also an apostle, meaning he was one who was divinely appointed and called to an important commission with a special message. Peter was one of 12 people, think about it, 12 people who was specifically chosen by Jesus Christ to be with him during his earthly ministry and to whom he entrusted the organization of his church. But Peter doesn't begin with the introduction of himself as an apostle, but as a servant. As an apostle, he had a lot to brag about, didn't he? He had a lot to be sort of, you know, a little arrogant about in a sense. Think about it, one of 12 people chosen by Jesus Christ. He was there to see it all, wasn't he? And if we look at verses 16, 17, and 18 of the same chapter, we read, Therefore, he received from God the Father honor and glory, with such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Peter says in verse 18, We heard this voice. Can you imagine being there? And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. You know, it's an amazing thing. Paul say, Peter says in verse 16 that they were, they were eyewitnesses of all this amazing life uh, that was contained and demonstrated through Jesus Christ. He experienced many of the miracles firsthand. He was present on the Mount of Transfiguration. He sat at the Last Supper as one who had his feet washed with the Lord and so on. Peter was an apostle, and after declaring to Jesus that Jesus was, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God, in Matthew 16 and 18, Jesus responded, again, think about this, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build 
my church. Peter was an apostle. And yet, as with anyone called to the service of the Lord, effectiveness and usefulness only results when humility is a primary character trait. You see that? Do you see why we could spend an entire message on just the introduction of this letter? Humility is such a key character trait required in those who seek to serve the Lord. You see, these two descriptors may have been reversed in this letter if it was written prior to the events of Matthew chapter 26. Let me remind you of that history uh, in, in Peter's life where we read this unfortunate piece of history, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 69. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. But when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I don't know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, think about that, began to curse and swear, saying, I don't know this man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and he wept bitterly. If we lack humility, we will be humbled, and it's only then we can truly be used in the Lord's service. Peter was first a servant now in his life. By self-description, he was a servant first. He was an apostle second. I may have shared this illustration with you uh, over the years, but it came to my mind again as we're kind of in the middle of uh, college football bowl season. This goes back a number of years. Chan Gale, a football coach for the uh, Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, told how he learned a lesson in humility. Gale was then head coach of Alabama's Troy State, and they were playing for a national championship. The week before the big game, he was headed to the practice field when a secretary called him back to take a phone call. Somewhat irritated, Gale told her to take a message because he was on his way to practice. She responded, but it's Sports Illustrated. Oh, I'll be right there, he said. As he made his way to the building, he began to think about the upcoming article. It would be, it would be great publicity for a small school like Troy State to be in Sports Illustrated. As he got closer, he realized that a three-page article wouldn't be sufficient to tell the whole story. Coming even closer to his office, he started to think that he might, he might be in the cover. Should I, should I pose for it, or should we ask him to take an action shot? His head was spinning with all the possibilities. When he picked up the phone and said hello, the person asked, is this Chan Galley? Yes, it is, he replied confidently. This is Sports Illustrated, and we're calling to let you know that your subscription is running out. Are you interested in renewing it? Coach Galey concluded the story by seeing, saying, you are either humble or you will be humbled. How about you? How about me? Are we humble servants of Jesus Christ? Humility is such a necessary character trait that will determine our usefulness and effectiveness in this life. As I was preparing this chapter and this thought, my Bible uh, is maybe like yours, a little reversed, but this is 2 Peter 1 here. As we look to the page that decided that concludes his first letter, what do we read there? We read this. Likewise, you younger people, be submit, uh, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with what? Humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares 
for you. Maybe this teaching was in was in Peter's mind as he as he started this introduction to Second Peter, his second letter. There, there's about a two, the scholars say, two to four year gap between First Peter and Second Peter. And if you look at the introduction of First Peter, you notice it's Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. There's nothing but being a servant. But he finishes this letter. He lives two, three, four years longer. He's no, he knows that he's nearing the end of his life. And so we are introduced to this man who, first of all, identifies himself as a humble bondservant of Jesus Christ. You see, we could go on and on on this simple but hugely significant point. And this is what God has been, again, teaching me. The, the significance of this attribute of humility. We need to carry on. Peter uh, continues this theme of humility in a sense when he comes to verses one and two. There we read this. To those who have obtained light, precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Peter is writing to Christians and he makes it clear that the, the outcomes of our precious faith, this is why I'm using the New King James here, that the outcomes of our precious faith, what a great statement, huh? our precious faith, the outcomes are no different than were his as an apostle in Jesus Christ. And, and, if, you, and if you look at the, the NASB, um, which I have, and I'm able to kind of have it my side here, the NSA, NASB, which uh, many would sort of say is one of the most uh, literal translations, but, but it says this, to those who have received the faith of the same kind as ours. Do you see the humility in that? Being an apostle didn't mean his precious faith had greater outcomes than the faith that you and I have exhibited in Jesus Christ. It's such a precious faith. William MacDonald writes, Peter means that it was a righteous thing for God to give this faith of equal standing to those who believe in the Lord Jesus. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection provide a just basis upon which God can show grace to sinners, all sinners through faith. The debt of sin has been fully paid, and now God can justify the ungodly sinner who believes on his son. Peter says, look, we... We share this precious faith. The people he was writing to, those of us who are reading it and studying it today, we share the same precious faith with the same amazing spiritual outcomes and benefits as the great apostle Peter, as the apostle Paul, as John. Go down the list. And there's humility in acknowledging that, isn't there? He doesn't say, look, well, you know, I'm an apostle, so I, I kind of have some in and can experience some things and have access to things that, that the rest of you don't. It's not that at all. It's like we are all in this together. We all share in this tremendous spiritual heritage and reality through our precious faith in Jesus Christ. Remember that word, precious. As we come to verse 3, Peter continues you got to listen to this carefully. Let this truth, let the word of God penetrate your heart as we read these words. Peter continues, his divine power. Ah, boy, there's, there's 11 weeks right there. His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. Faith is the channel through which we receive indescribable blessing from the Lord. His grace truly is amazing. At that moment of believing faith, our sins are forgiven. Our relationship with God is restored. We inherit eternal life. And according to this statement before us in verse 3, his divine power gives us all things. Like you could underline every word in these 11 verses. His divine power gives us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. 
at the beginning of 2021, do you believe that? Do you believe that because of your precious faith, through your precious faith, we have access to divine power that gives us all things, not some things, but all things that pertain to life and godliness. Wow. Talk about, talk about precious faith, huh? God's divine power is enacted on our behalf through the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures to give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. You see, people seek out life. They, they pursue godliness, just meaning character transformation, in all kinds of interesting ways. And I'm not saying some of those ways don't have value. Some may have some practical value. I don't doubt that. But friends, here Peter tells us that the Lord has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life, real life, eternal life. And all that comes with it is found in and through the divine power. Let me ask you this question. Let's stop here. There's a lot to absorb. Let me stop and ask you this. Have you, have I, have we unleashed the divine power through faith in Jesus Christ to experience this kind of life? Have we utilized the divine power, acknowledged it, received it, understood it, unleashed it, to use that word, to experience true life, real life, eternal life? The kingdom of God is a present reality in our world and accessible to those who will enter it through faith in Jesus. Those who participate in God's kingdom avail themselves to the power of God in this life. On this topic, Dallas Willard shares the following story. As a child, I lived in an area of southern Missouri where electricity was available only in the form of lightning. <laughs> That's an interesting place to grow up, huh? We had more of that than we could use. But in my senior year of high school, the Rural Electrification Administration extended its lines into the area where we lived and electrical power became available to households and farms. When those lines came by our farm, a very different way of living presented itself. Our relationships to fundamental aspects of life, daylight and dark, hot and cold, clean and dirty, work and leisure, preparing food and preserving it, could then be vastly changed for the better. But we still had to believe in the electricity and its arrangements, understand them, and take the practical steps involved in relying on it. You may think the comparison rather crude, and in some respects it is, but it will help to understand Jesus' basic message about the kingdom of heaven if we pause to reflect on those farmers who, in effect, heard the message, repent, for electricity is at hand. Repent or turn from your kerosene lamps and lanterns, your ice boxes and cellars, your scrub boards, your rug beaters, your self-powered sewing machines, your radio with dry cell batteries. The power that could make their lives far better was right there near them. By making relatively simple arrangements, they could utilize it. Strangely, a few didn't accept it. They didn't enter the kingdom of electricity. Some just didn't want to change. Others couldn't afford it, so they thought. Imagine that. And yet, friends, we read here this morning in our passage about divine power. <laughs> Through our precious faith, the same power that Peter experienced that that same divine power is available to each one of us to give us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Verse 3 tells us that we've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. And we come to verse 4, notice that we've been given some more things. I know Christmas has passed, but here in this passage, we're, we're opening more gifts, aren't we? 
as, as Peter tells us, what we've been given. So first of all, we've been given this divine power that gives us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Now in verse 4 we read that we've also been given exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now just understand the context here. The apostle Peter was about to die. We didn't read, but we will we'll do that now. Let's read verses 12 through 15 of this same chapter, verse 12 of 2 Peter 1. For this reason, Peter writes, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent or body, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus showed me. Moreover, I'll be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. We're reading the final words, the final written words of the Apostle Peter. And in this final communication, he wanted to emphasize the importance of godly character. You see, who we are, get this, who we are is more important than what we do. You follow me? I'm not so sure I had that straight for a lot of years. Being a doer, being a bit of a type A person, it's all about getting the list checked off or, or taking on responsibility, getting it all done. But at this stage in my life and appreciating the influence of my dear wife, I understand this, this truth. Who we are is more important than what we do. Who I am is more important than what I do, meaning that if I am in character, who I'm supposed to be, then what I do will have way greater significance and impact. Now, there's a, if we pay attention and care about what's going on inside with respect to character, then then my, the, the words, the work, will have greater impact and significant, won't they? Peter was seeking to strengthen his readers against the opposition and false teaching of the day. And in order to stand strong, we need to access the divine power, notice that in verse 3, to be partakers of the divine nature, verse 4. Do you, do you see that? Again, this is why I'm using the New King James Version uh, the, the language is repetitive, and I'm glad it is. So we read in verse 3 about the divine power. Now we come to verse 4, and we read that we've been given exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. Peter is concerned about holy living. He's concerned about the process of sanctification. We are called to live holy lives. That comes from first peter if we were to uh, look back at it we we need to be reminded that as christians we are called to be like our lord and in romans chapter 8 verse 29 for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and when we come over to second corinthians chapter 3 we read there this again familiar statement but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Peter is concerned in these final written words about our character. And he, he says, you've been given the divine power to pursue the divine nature, to be like Christ, to develop these qualities, these characteristics, these attributes. And as we grow in this process, as, as this ongoing process of sanctification takes place in our lives, friends, we will be able to stand strong against the opposition. We will be able to be the witnesses we're called to be. We will, with, with power and loving influence, be able to make impact in the world in which we live. The divine power referenced in verse 3 is graciously provided to us through the Holy Spirit, through the knowledge of him who called us, and through the exceedingly great and precious promises 
provided for us in the scriptures. Do, do you want, let's pause again. Let's just pause again. Do you want to become more like Jesus? Do you want strength to stand strong in the face of opposition and turmoil? Talk about living in turmoil, huh? If so, add to your faith the growing character of the divine nature through accessing the knowledge of him who called you and embrace the exceedingly great and precious promises given to you. Do you love that statement? Notice that these promises, friends, are described as, first of all, being exceedingly great. <laughs> what a statement. The promises of Scripture, the promises of this book, Peter describes them as being exceedingly great. The promises of Scripture are exceedingly great, which, which means, get this, it means that they are magnificent. Don't you love that word? That's one of those great words of the English language. They are magnificent. That's what the NASB says in this verse. It describes them, the exceedingly great promises. They are magnificent, meaning they are large. They're great in their widest sense. One lovely moonlit night, my small granddaughter, this is a story, this isn't my experience. Uh, one lovely moonlit night, my small granddaughter and I went for a walk. The stars were magnificent. As I named individual stars and constellations, my granddaughter explained, exclaimed, Grandma, if the bottom side of heaven is this beautiful, just think how wonderful the other side must be. <laughs> you know, we think about something being magnificent. We, we think of those amazing skies on those clear nights when we're up north, when we're away from lights, and we just are in awe of our creator and the magnificence of creation. I was speaking to a friend of mine who moved to Scottsdale, Arizona just a short time ago, and they live up in a beautiful mountainous kind of part of the state. Uh, outside of Scottsdale, and, and he lives in what they describe as a dark community. And, and he said, what that means is uh, they're having a house built. All the lights have to be either on the ground or they have to be pointing down. They don't want any light pollution going up in these dark communities so that there is nothing ever taken away from the magnificence of that beautiful sky. Friends, Peter uses this language to describe the exceedingly great and precious promises of Scripture. They are magnificent, and we are to access these promises as part of understanding the divine power to experience the divine nature, to experience this character transformation, this process of sanctification. Also notice that these promises are described as precious. Remember, I told you to remember that word from our first few comments. Here it is again. And we find repetition here again helpful. We've seen the word divine, divine power, and divine nature, verses 3 and 4. Here now in verses 1 and 4, we find the word precious being used again. This is a word we have already encountered. And our precious faith is founded and grounded on these precious promises. You see why I'm using this translation today? The repetition is helpful, isn't it? Let me just give you this summary statement that I've used to, to help me remember, retain, and think more about this. Precious faith in the precious promises enables me to experience the divine power to embrace the divine nature. <laughs> Let me say it again. That's just the statement I created using these statements from this text. Precious faith in the precious promises enables us to experience the divine power to embrace the divine nature. We have access to divine power to be partakers of the divine nature. These characteristics and attributes of the divine nature will enable us to stand strong in the face of opposition. These, these qualities will empower our witness and our work for Jesus Christ. Apparently, uh, I read this, this this week, apparently there are at least 
30,000 promises in the Bible, 30,000. You want to start a little Bible study today that will see me through retirement and into eternity? Let's start looking at each of those promises. <laughs> We'd be out of for a while, wouldn't we? 30,000 promises. And here are a few of these promises that relate to the life of holiness. Psalm 50, 15, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Joshua 1, 5, I will not leave you nor forsake you. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Friends, we need to embrace the divine the divine power to experience and grow towards the, the image, the, the perfection of Jesus Christ as we pursue the divine nature. And we, we can do that as we, through our precious faith, embrace these wonderful, precious promises of God. The mechanism of the divine power are the exceedingly great and precious promises of Scripture as revealed and taught to us by the Holy Spirit. Do you want to grow? Do I want to grow? In, in 2021, do, do we want to grow? Do we want to become more strong and resilient? Do we want our lives to conform more and more to the image of Jesus Christ? If so, turn to the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the scriptural character changes we need to make. Once we understand what changes, changes need to be, let's exercise precious faith in the precious promises to help us achieve that change. You know, I, I guess I've said this, I, I know I've said it, and I hear other people say it. You know, Dr. Doug, I just see you in my, my picture there. We've known each other for a long time. And, and you know, I, I, there's just some things I can't change, Doug. That, that's just who I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, some of those things need to change, Dale. And that is a cop-out statement. That's just who I am. Well, if it doesn't align with the character of my Savior and Lord, then, friend, I need to change. I need to work at changing. And I'm not saying that's easy. But as we understand what's before us today, precious faith in the precious promises enable us to access the divine power to pursue the divine nature. And yes, I can change. 2021 is going to be a, a big year in our house. We, we, there's obviously, we don't know what's going to happen. Some of the things that are in this year are, I won't give my wife's secret away, but I turned 60 in April. Lord willing, plan to retire at the end of June. There's a lot of change. But as the years click by, this growth process needs to be ongoing. And hopefully that process of sanctification will be your experience and mine as we seek to honor the Lord. But what does godly character look like? So this is where we're going to, I need to close. This is where we're going to conclude uh, this morning. You see, what does godly character look like? Well, we get more specific over the next few weeks when we turn our attention to verses 5, 6, and 7 of this amazing chapter where we read this, but also for this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. That's where we're going over the next three weeks, and then we have the outcomes of this pursuit laid out for us in verses 8 through 11, which are amazing. There's some incredible statements awaiting us there. Precious faith in the precious promises enable us to experience the divine power to embrace the divine nature. As we continue to change and live more of the sanctified life, our words and our works will result in a greater witness for Jesus Christ. And I just need to close with this final illustration. Lee Strobel is somebody known to, to many of us, obviously an incredible writer. His story is quite well known if you've read any of his books, but here's just an excerpt from an interview he gave in 2016, 
When his wife unexpectedly converted to Christianity, former atheist Lee Strobel said her decision left the couple teetering on divorce. A demonstration of Christ's love, however, would tip the scales. This was an interview he did with uh, the Christian, uh, Christian Post. I had married one Leslie, the fun Leslie, the carefree Leslie, he said, the risk-taking Leslie. And now I feared she was going to turn into some sort of prude who would trade our upwardly mobile lifestyle for all-night prayer vigils and volunteering at soup kitchens. Strobel says a woman who lived in their condo building disrupted the status quo in their marriage. It wasn't until my, my, my wife met a woman in the same condo building who was a Christian and they became friends that she ultimately came to faith in Christ and told me that she'd become a Christian, which my initial reaction was to divorce her. Think about that. I didn't want to be married to a Christian, and I thought she was going to turn into some holy ruler or something. Strobel says he was surprised, however, listen to this, by the changes he saw in his wife. He wrote in his book, I was pleasantly surprised, even fascinated, by the fundamental changes in her character. Do you see, friends, the power of character change? Do you see why, in light of all that these people are experiencing in Peter's day, all that we're experiencing in our day, why character is so key to our witness for Christ? After two years of intense research, sorry, he was so impacted by these changes that he felt compelled to search the Bible to figure out how the positive differences came about. Eventually, I wanted to get to the bottom of what was prompting these subtle but significant shifts in my wife's character, so I launched an all-out investigation of the facts surrounding the case of Christianity, which many of us know about. After two years of intense research using his investigative skills as a former journalist for the Chicago Tribune, consulting uh, with more than 12 leading biblical theologians, scholars, and experts, Strobel learned that the Christian creed was solid, and he converted to Christianity, as we know, many decades ago. See the power of a changed life. See the power of character change. Friends, God bless you in the week that is ahead. Um, it's so great being back with you. And I just pray that the Lord will encourage you as he's encouraging me to become the person, to continue to become the person that he wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the divine power that enables us to pursue the divine nature. Father, this is possible through precious faith and the precious promises. Help us to learn them. Help us to follow them. Help us to uh, follow the leading of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, I know I'm a, I'm a work in progress. And even at the almost age of 60, there's, there's so much more that needs to change. And I just pray that you'll continue to be patient and gracious as you've been over all these years, I'm so grateful, Father, for your grace, for your mercy, for your patience with a wretched sinner like me. Father, help us become more like your son. We ask your blessing upon each one in the week that is ahead, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.